Why hello there, Chris here from Shake the Box, and I'm going to give you my thoughts, my feelings, and perhaps just a tiny slice of my soul regarding the game Thea The Awakening for the Nintendo Switch. Now if the name Thea sounds familiar, it's probably because way back in 2015 this game was released on Steam, and an expansion released in 2016, so this is not a new game by any stretch of the imagination. But it is new to the Switch, released February 1st, 2019, for $18, it's just now hitting the Switch world. So if you have a Switch, and you're not particularly fond of PC gaming, this might be the game for you. Or even if you are a fan of PC gaming, we're actually going to talk about this, but I think this game is particularly well suited to the Switch, but we'll get into that a little bit later. First off, let's talk about how the game plays. I play this both in TV mode and portable mode, and I would say it controls great in either sense. I didn't have any one control scheme that I thought was better than the other, I enjoyed it playing it in the handheld mode with the Pro Controller and also with the Joy-Cons, so no matter how you want to control this game, it's going to control just fine. Graphically, I'd say the game is very pretty on the Switch. Uh, everything looks nice and crisp and clear, the art style is standard high fantasy stuff, but mixed with Slavic mythology, and it's a very good art style they have going on. I like their illustrations. Uh, the 3D models are serviceable. You only ever encounter those on your your map screen when you're doing the, the high strategy stuff, the grand strategy stuff, and it all works out just fine. You could zoom in, zoom out. It's great. Uh, one place I would say the art style isn't so great is the card game. It's, it's a very muted color palette. It's a lot of parchment with black. I feel like we could have had some colors splashed in there to really make it sing. But I'm also not a big fan of the card game to begin with. So again, we're going to get more into that as we go. I just want to talk about how it looks and how it controls right now. And I feel like I've accomplished that. But we do have to talk about how it sounds. Uh, similarly, I would say the game sounds good. Uh, it has the kind of music you would expect from this kind of game. A lot of f standard fantasy fair music. There are some tracks that I found myself pretty engaged with and humming along, but for the most part, the music is just kind of a background experience. But that's what you're looking for, you know? You just want something to just be there and guide you through the experience. Sound effects wise, nothing stand out, but that's probably a good thing, you know? It, the menus make noise. When you do things, they react. When you're in combat, you hear the clang of swords on shields. And when you're having a speech uh, event, a lot of cards say, moo, 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 and moo, 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 which I find very endearing and charming. I like that. But where the game really shines is the narrator. I love this guy. I want to say he has a British accent. I'm no expert on accents, but that's what it sounds like to me. And this dude does a wonderful job narrating you through the experience. But what's awesome is when you talk to a new character or engage with something that isn't the narrator voice, the narrator does a voice for that person. So it's kind of fun when there's exposition carried up by the narrator, and then a character speaks, because it's clearly the same dude. And this guy does all the voices, as far as I can tell. He's Theodore, your demon friend, who's uh, your tutorial aide. He's also a dragon. He's also a wind spirit. He's also a living tree. He's everybody. Which I think is the most endearing thing in the world. It makes it feel like you're living through an audiobook at times. And I think that's great. And stares at you with his large yellow eyes. What do you want? You looking for trouble? Because I could get you some. Man, graphics and sound are such an easy part of the review, right? We're already done. That was like not even two paragraphs. Anyway, let's get on to the hard part. So, in order to break this down, we're going to elevator pitch this thing and then go from there. So, Thea is a turn-based strategy game mixed with a survival game, mixed with a management sim, mixed with an RPG, mixed with a card game, and then sprinkled with roguelike on top. And it's all dressed up in a high fantasy Slavic mythology coat. Honestly, for me, the easiest comparison point is a spin-off game to a very old computer game franchise called Lords of the Realm, a game series I grew up with 
Uh, the spin-off was called Lords of Magic, a game I played way too much of as a child. Uh, much like Lords of Magic, Thea the Awakening is a game where you're on a grand quest, you're trying to juggle all of your responsibilities, and you're working to succeed at various events and encounters. It's just that Thea takes the complexity knob and wrenches that thing all the way into the complexity zone and then snaps the dial off. You start things off by choosing a god to play as. Uh, at first, you only have two choices here. There's the god of life and the god of death. Uh, cool kids are going to play as Morena, god of death, because you're cool. Uh, but once you've progressed along your particular god's unlocking progression, uh, gods can accumulate experience and you can unlock abilities for those gods, which will make the game easier for you. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's sprinkled with roguelike, and that's where that comes in. Uh, the game is very difficult at first, you will die, but as you upgrade your gods, you'll find the game's more forgiving, so it rewards you for replaying the game. As you progress in that one god you're playing as, when you hit the third progression point, I want to say, you unlock four additional gods. There are two more gods after that, with more challenging criteria. I know one of them is unlock all the other gods, so that's the last god you're going to play as, that one. So right away, the player here can see this is a game with long-term progression. It's going to be rewarding you for playing over a long course of time, which is nice. Sometimes that's the kind of game you're looking to sink your teeth into for 400 hours. And boy, do those gods you play as affect all sorts of keywords. See, this isn't a simple management simulation, which you would be forgiven for thinking that was the case if you just looked at screenshots. It looks a lot like Civilization. No. What you have here is a much more complicated game. On the surface, yes, you are going to be responsible for the nitty gritty goings on of your settlement. You're going to be managing your villagers. You're going to tell them what to craft, what to build, what to harvest. You're going to progress through tech trees that are going to increase the potency and possibilities of what those can do. It's basically its own game. It's its own simulation management game right there. It's robust. It's full. There's a whole game to play in just that regard. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. This is a Russian nesting doll of complicated games. Once you peel back that first layer, you're going to find that every villager has extensive stats, and those stats can be improved through leveling up or by equipping certain things. You could form parties of your villagers and send them out into the world where they need to manage their food, their fuel, their health, their equipment. They could explore ruins. They could talk to fun folklore and fantasy inspired creatures and people and they can try to survive various encounters and challenges in the world. You'll have many situations where you have three to four different ways to handle a situation, depending on the stats of your party. But what's crazy is when you first start, you're going to notice things like 11 options unavailable on the screen. Because there's so many different stats the villagers are capable of having, the game will let you use almost all of them to solve many of the situations you'll find yourself in. I know I couldn't help but wonder, what the hell else could I be doing in this event every time I did something, because I was early on in the game, and as I played more, I unlocked more and more of those options as I replayed certain events. I have certainly not seen every option for every scenario, I've barely scratched the surface of this game, and I played like 40 hours. And again, this is like its own game. It's like a party management RPG game. It's like Darkest Dungeon in a way. Next layer. We're not done yet, of course. So those encounters come in nine distinct flavors. You have combat, you have folklore, you have stealth, you have hunting, you have speech. All of these are different ways to handle scenarios, encounters, events, the game calls them. And those are often resolved with a card game. Now, depending on the type of encounter it is, It'll change how your cards work, the stats that are important on the cards, and the abilities those cards have. I am not a particularly big fan of the card game, but I am a big fan of stats. So the way I tend to do this is I use the auto resolve button, and it just does it for me, and I could pretend that this is the game where I'm just using my stats and abilities to get through certain encounters. One important thing to note is because these represent your villagers, if you are in a combat event and your cards are injured, that will directly translate to injuries with your villagers, so you gotta be careful. 
Uh, whereas other types of events don't actually injure your characters, because how would talking, you know, result in Jimmy losing his leg? That wouldn't make any sense. So that's that's the card game. It's a very complicated card game that I do not fully understand, and I choose to believe the auto-resolve button is the one true path. Hashtag auto-resolve life. Now this isn't actually much of a dig at the game either, this is just how I am as a player. When I play the Total War games, I tend to hit the little uh, fight for me button, you know, auto-resolve. I'm here for the, the grand management of a world, the subterfuge, the diplomacy elements, I don't really care that much for the palate cleansing system a lot of these games employ where like, oh hey, you've been doing that for like two hours, why don't you fight a battle? No, like I'm fine, I'm here to do this for hours. Trust me, I play JRPGs, I'm used to doing the same thing for hours and hours and hours. I don't really need a palate cleanser. Now you might be thinking, what are these events for in the game? You haven't really got into that. Well, not only does the world have random encounters that will happen, you'll also see wandering monsters on the map. You could fight them. You can go into various locations in the map and explore dungeons, all through text. It's not, it's not actually dungeon crawling, it's text-based. All of this is usually revolving around the plot. It's probably going to take you a lot of attempts to get through the full game. Again, it's roguelike in this way. But what I like is that the game is respectful of your time. When you're going through and you're doing the plot, you're going to do the plot over and over again because obviously you died and you're doing this game again. The random events keep it nice and fresh and then the plot is this one consistent bit. The game will let you skip all of the heavy exposition bits and heavy dialogue elements of the plot. It even says right at the bottom like, hey, I know what's going on, skip the plot. It's respectful of your time in this way. And that's a theme in the game. And there's a lot of options that will automatically speed up enemy things. It keeps the game nice and snappy, which is good for such a slow game. It's, it's again, not, not an action combat heavy experience. We're talking slow, choices matter, you're spending your time with this kind of game. Now let's dive a little bit more into the plot. Uh, the narrative of this game is great, I love it. Uh, the gist of it is that the world has just finished a period of darkness, hashtag Dark Souls, after the world tree was burned down. All the races are currently weak and trying to survive, and the gods have been absent for a hundred years of darkness. But what I find very exciting is, because you're learning these things after the fact, you might learn something later on that will change your view of something that happened earlier in the game, which is why it's nice that you keep doing these over and over again, over and over again as you die. You might have one opinion at the beginning, and then, you know, eight hours later when you're doing it a second time, like, oh, fuck this dude, he is clearly lying to me. I met someone who was there. And then something else will happen later on that will change that. What it all really boils down to is you are trying to choose how the world is going to move forward from here. You're trying to decide what's humanity's place in this world. Are you going to drive out magic and make this a world for humanity? Are you going to allow this weird twilight balance to remain so that the orcs, who aren't as bad as you may have thought they were, can survive right alongside the elves and humanity and dwarves? Or will you do what the gods and the elves want, which is bring the world back to a world of light and magic and let the gods return and have the elves return to their full power? It's all up to you. There are a lot of very compelling figures in the game who will make sound arguments for all three of these possibilities, and more. But it's really you, the player. Like, are you going to go one way or the other? What are your thoughts on how this should go? I like it because I like stories about complicated moral decisions. Like, what's right for everybody? You're a human, so obviously you want humanity to thrive, but do you want that to happen at the expense of other races? If you want things to stay balanced like they are currently, I mean, that's causing a lot of suffering in the world. Everyone is basically scraping by. It's not great. It's just fair. And then letting the world return to one of magic means humanity is going to be under the boot heel of the elves again. Like, you're just going to be there. You're not going to be important. The elves are going to be the good ones. And of course, the lesser races, as they're called, the, the orcs and the ones that are seen as dark, quote-unquote, they're going to suffer, so you need to choose, like, how's this all gonna shake out? I will admit it can be on the repetitive side, having to do the main plot over and over again, but I think that element of it, the fact that you learn new details as you go and you can reevaluate how you feel about these characters, 
doesn't make it a bad kind of repetitive. It makes it the good kinds. And that's coming from someone, just to be clear, who loves playing games like Long Live the Queen. Games where you're going through a story over and over again just to find like those one new variations. So I don't mind reliving the same plot knowing that I'm going to learn new details or find variations on it. It all works toward a bigger complete picture, so I find that rewarding. But if that's not your kind of thing, just be aware of it and know that you could skip the dialogue by pressing a button. It's nice and streamlined that way. Uh, speaking of repetitive, while I do enjoy the DLC content that's included with this game, The Awakening of Giants does come with a number of repetitive events that I find not terribly interesting. To be more specific, I do like the DLC story. I think it's good. Uh, there are a number of good events with it, but there are a number of just super generic events that happen, uh, nam namely tremors. Like, tremors will happen constantly, and it might just be that I was circling a specific area that caused them to happen a lot, but they're not challenging or interesting. Most of them don't even allow you to, to use your abilities or skill checks to try and get through it. It's just the ground shook. You have to click through a couple of screens of text and then it's over. Or worse, the ground shook, everybody took a little bit of damage. It's just... it's just not interesting. I know it's flavor and it's like really setting the stage for the fact that giants are awakening and stomping around, but I feel like that should happen as a heralding of the event and not continue happening after you've already, you know, had a party get murdered by a giant. Like, at that point we know they're here. We don't need that, uh, oh, what's that shaking doing? So, be prepared for the ground to shake a whole lot and for you not to have a lot of choices uh, in the matter. And it can sometimes feel like the game's being unfair when you've just gotten through a number of bad combat encounters, your party's beleaguered and injured, and then the ground shakes four turns in a row and everybody dies because you couldn't heal properly and everyone was taking additional damage. Maybe I'm just bitter because this actually happened to me. <laughs> Speaking of it happening to me, that's really how I want to review this game. I would like to tell you a story about one of my playthroughs, I think specifically it was the first one. And if it sounds like a good time to you, then you're gonna know this is a good time for you! I had an expedition that I decided was going to try and find the edge of the map. And I was playing on a medium map, but it's still huge. Like, it's obscured because I haven't been there and it's a mystery. I wanted to strike off in a straight line, or as straight as I could, and find the edge of the world. I gathered my fiercest warriors, my most sage scholars. We're talking anyone who had the biggest number in a relevant stat, <laughs> they were in the party. These people got my best gear, they got all the best food. Again, this is a game of complexity, so you actually have bonuses if you have a variety of food, so be prepared for that. Uh, they got all the good stuff, and I sent them off on their adventure. Well, on this journey, what I didn't expect is I found some pretty amazing stuff. I got the rarest weapons, the rarest armor. I found crafting materials I didn't even know existed in this game. It was amazing. It was a smorgasbord of fabulous new wealth. And I was far from home. I was on the other side of like a goddamn lake and also far away. So it was it was a tough trek. And my party was nearly over encumbered. That's right, everyone's least favorite mechanic in video games is very represented here. So I decide, obviously, these people need to come home with these goodies because I want it. I need this stuff. My hope is that they'll burn through enough wood and enough food along the way to keep me in the black weight-wise as I pick up new things, because obviously we're going to get into fights and it's going to have loot, and I don't want to leave anything behind. Uh, being the fool that I am, I decide that I want this to happen fast, so I have the move during the day as well as during the night. During the day, your character can see many hexes away. You know exactly what's there, you can avoid encounters, at least the ones that are on the map. At night, you can see one hex away. If you walk into an enemy while you're traversing the map, you have to fight that enemy. It's combat o'clock if that happens. So obviously we walk directly into a clump of enemies. Not just one enemy, it was like, a conference was happening. All of the big four skull raided enemies were having a goddamn conference right there and I walked into the middle of it, which is terrible. So obviously everything went foobar real fast. We lost a party member and it was rough, everyone was injured. And I think to myself, all right, we're just gonna run away. We're gonna deal with it. 
I can't move. My party is stuck in the middle of all these high level encounters. I'm literally surrounded on three sides. And I realize my party is over encumbered because the person that died, their ability to carry went away. So my, my weight limit dropped by one human strength worth of weight. And on top of that, we have all their crap. The body's gone, but we have all their equipment, all of their armor and weapons. So that's real bad for us. So painfully, I start selecting things to abandon, mostly their stuff, some food now that someone's not eating and some wood. And of course, I can't get away. I'm still hit by more of these fights. Another death. We have to do it again. This continues until I have a party of two struggling to get home. We managed to get away from the encounters and these people are carrying only the most amazing treasures. They left their own things behind. They are strictly carrying brand new wealth for me. Finally, my village is in sight. It's clear, it's daytime, there's no enemies on the map. We're gonna be okay. Except we're not, an event happens. So, as I mentioned, you can see enemies on the map, but some events just happen. They could happen in your village or they could happen to your expeditions. Multiple could happen in a turn. This was the kind of event that happens without enemies on the screen. <laughs> this was a mugging. We were jumped. We have an angry gang of orcs demanding we leave all of our equipment for them, or we fight. Now, I'm not about to give up all this treasure without a fight, so I choose the fight. And you better believe we lose. We lose hard. We lose every single thing we were carrying except for the garbage. They left the logs with us. They took the food! and all of the equipment. My party is grievously injured, but they're alive at least. So, I take a minute to not scream because I'm currently at work while I'm playing this, and I, I just take a deep breath, I sigh, and I hit the end turn button thinking, well, at least they're going to make it home. My last two warriors are going to make it home, and that's good, because I left my village defended by exclusively scholars, and gatherers, and craftspeople. It's a very weak, easily destroyed location, and I got lucky that it wasn't attacked while I was away. So I hit the end turn button, and I get prepared to move my people into place. Except that's not going to happen, of course, because when the turn starts, we open with an event. Tremors. Giants are walking around somewhere. The ground shakes. My crew, they scramble to grab onto something. Any purchase to keep them safe. We fail and they take more damage. They both die. I look at a pile of nothing on the screen. It's just a pile of wood, basically, just like three tiles away from home. And then on the edge of our, our bubble of light that we can see what's going on, I watch as several high-level mobs, I'm pretty sure the same ones that murdered our party, begin closing in on my village of exclusively crafts people, <laughs> farmers and scholars. I decide, maybe next turn, I'll change gods. <laughs> Thea the Awakening, I would say, is a pretty solid game to own for the Switch. It's perfect for it. I, I actually prefer owning this on the Switch over owning it on the PC. And the reason I say this is, I could sit down for a nice long TV session. I could really get engrossed, I could spend a lot of time on it, several hours just playing on the TV. I could follow that up another day, or even later that day, with mini sessions. You know, while I'm eating my lunch, or I'm waiting for a doctor's appointment, or I'm on a bus, or a train, wherever you may be, whatever transport you use. You could find a moment to pop open Thea, make a couple of good choices, outfit your team or something. You could do some of the micromanagement work. And because it's turn-based and there's no split-second decision-making to be made, I think it's perfect for it. It's perfect for a game that is both portable and non-portable. It's where the Switch really shines, which is why I think it's a perfect game for the Switch. Just be prepared to be playing this game for a long time. Like we mentioned earlier on, this is a game that wants you to replay it over and over again, to play it different ways, to change which gods you're playing as, to choose different perks for your villagers. Are they going to be focusing on being warriors, on craftspeople, on scholars? It's going to reward you for taking different paths throughout the world, exploring... I believe the maps are different every time. I don't remember seeing that lake a second time I played. But it will reward you for choosing different ways of dealing with encounters. It's the kind of game that will open up the more you play it, both narratively, 
when you're experiencing the very polite dragon for the seventh time as you try and get those damn tree shards, maybe this time you're going to go with a stealthy route. Or maybe you have really worked hard and you have a great speech group of villagers. These people could talk their way out of any situation and they're going to walk right over that dragon with speech. Or maybe you're just going to murder the dragon. Like you could do it any way you want. And every time you play, it could be a little bit different. It rewards multiple play sessions, it rewards long play sessions. It's nice to have on the Switch as a digital download, that way, you know, I'm bored of playing Smash today, let's take a break. Maybe we'll bump ourselves up a little bit in Thea. I know I'm personally looking forward to playing more. Uh, I will be upfront, did not finish the game, I played for 40 hours! I don't think I'm anywhere near done with it. And that's just the kind of game it is. And if that's the kind of game you're looking for, get it for your Switch. Just don't spend too long between play sessions, because again, it's a complicated game, and you don't want to forget how some of the mechanics work in between sessions, because boy, are there a lot. Seriously though, like, can someone please explain to me how the card game works? Specifically, I don't know how many action points I get each turn, I don't know how that's determined. Every phase, I have a different number of action points. I swear the game said check the tutorial to find out. I checked it, and I don't remember finding an answer in there. It's just, I, I don't know how this card game works. Which is weird, because I'm a card game guy. <laughs> it's like what I do all the time, I play card games. Anyway, the bottom line is, does Chris from Shake the Box recommend Thea, The Awakening for the Switch? Yes, he does. That's weird, talking in third person. Yes, I do. I give it a thumbs up, I like it. Check it out. And if you don't have a Switch, hey, you can always check it out on Steam. So that's convenient, right? Anyway, I've been Chris, this has been a review of Thea, and I hope you enjoyed this. This has actually been our first review on the channel. I kinda hope that more, more developers send us keys for review purposes, because this is how I started. I used to work for a, a, a little tiny video game website and I was one of the review dudes like that's what I that's what I did I reviewed video games so it's nice to be back in the saddle I'm definitely rusty I feel like I could have done a better job with this review but you know what you got to start somewhere and I'm happy I got to start with Thea the awakening anyway be sure to like comment subscribe ring the bell like, let me know what your thoughts are on Thea. Did you play it? Do you disagree? Do you agree? Comment below. Let me know. Is there a game you want me to review? Let me know. Did I do a good job? Let me know. Did I do a terrible job? Don't let me know. No, no, you can, you can let me know. And again, be sure to subscribe and come on back because we have all kinds of fun stuff in the future. We update every day with at least one video, sometimes two, sometimes more. So stick around. We like you here. Oh, and of course, check us out on Twitch. We are Shake the Box over there, just like we are here. You'll know because we have the same goofy cat, Schrodingus, as the mascot, and you'll hear my terrible voice over there as well. Okay, bye. God, I'm so good at outros. Fucking nailed that one. I should do, like, everyone's outros. People should hire me just to outro them when they're leaving the room. Like, they get their stupid latte at Starbucks. I'd be the guy that'd be like, Hey, thanks for giving him that latte. And he just wants to say, he'll see you next time. Bye-bye.